Well, good evening, church family. It's uh, our Wednesday night Bible study time as we continue and almost come to an end to our study in the book of John. We have a couple more weeks uh, in the book of John, and the Lord's been putting some things on my heart, and so we hope that next week we'll be able to announce where we're going to go to next in, in the Word of God after we finish John. But we'll be in John for the next two or three weeks, and then we'll finish up. But we're glad you're with us tonight. Uh, hope you've had a good week so far. Hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying warm and inside. And you enjoyed the snowflakes coming down yesterday uh, from the inside of your house looking out the window at those things. But they were pretty, and we always are amazed at the beauty of God uh, when we see things like the, the snow we had yesterday. Very pretty. So, uh, again, we're glad you're with us tonight. And uh, we... Uh, Hope that as we look at the Word of God, God just reveals to our heart what He'd have us to know as we continue our study in the book of John. And we'll be in John, the 20th chapter. We're going to finish up the 20th chapter uh, tonight. And as we look tonight, we're looking at the resurrection of Christ. And so as we, as we think about and look at the resurrection of Christ, we, we know that the, the resurrection was just really the divine affirmation of Christ's atonement that uh, uh, he, when he went to the cross and when he gave up his life on the cross and he accomplished everything that God had intended for him to accomplish, then the di divine affirmation of that cross was the resurrection. Now remember, without the resurrection, we would have no salvation. Without the resurrection, we would have no gospel. Without the resurrection, we would have no good news. So we are, we are grateful for the resurrection. Amen? And so as we look at the resurrection tonight, as we look a little bit, and we always remember that as we look at uh, the, the Scripture, John has a little bit of a different take on on. Uh, everything than the synoptic gospels do. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, uh, but it's a very distinct look, and as we look at the Word of God tonight. But again, as we talk about the the cross, we talk about the resurrection being the affirmation of the cross. We know that that God raised Jesus from the dead, and He, he declared when He did that, He declared. I am well pleased with my son. I, I am pleased that he fulfilled and accomplished what I asked him to do. I'm, I'm pleased with the sacrifice that Jesus made. And when he said he was pleased with it, what he was saying was, he was saying, I am going to allow that sacrifice to cover the sins of all mankind for eternity. What he did, he, he completely satisfied the demands of, of holy justice when he hung there on the cross. And so we are grateful to God for his son Jesus Christ who went to the cross and because he went to the cross we can have e eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. So as we think about that uh, tonight I, I want us to to think about that with grateful hearts and grateful minds. Paul, Paul wrote this in Romans 4 25. He said, He who was delivered over because of our wrongdoing, because of our sin, because of our inadequacies, and he was raised because of our justification. In other words, he, he hung on the cross because of our sins, and because he did, we were justified in and through his resurrection. The resurrection also demonstrates that where sin is atoned for, Death is conquered and eternal life is given. See, that's so important for us to understand tonight that sin was conquered, sin was atoned for, death was conquered, and eternal life was made available through the cross and the resurrections. Now, I want you to write something down for me tonight. Get your pa piece of paper out, get your pencil, and write this statement down. It is impossible to believe in the Jesus of the Bible without believing that he rose bodily from the dead. Did you get that? I want you to write it down. I'm going to say it again. It is impossible to believe in the Jesus of the Bible without believing that he rose bodily 
from the dead. There, there are those who do not believe this happened. There are those that deny the very resurrection of Christ. They are saying that he did not, he raised from the dead, that it's a lie. Uh, that they, 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 they put all kinds of, of uh, uh, stories towards this resurrection. Um, but we know that the resurrection is essential to the the, the, the good news, essential to our way of life as a Christian, essential to the gospel and salvation. We know that denying that Christ rose from the dead renders uh, really any profession of faith, any belief in him meaningless. In other words, he, if, we, if we don't believe that he physically rose from the dead, if, if we don't believe that he, he bodily walked out of that tomb and, and, uh, and, and lived again, then our belief as a Christian is meaningless. It has no meaning. Also, if we think about it, to, to, to deny the resurrection is to just really to fly in the face of an overwhelming historical evidence. In other words, if we don't believe that he rose from the dead, then we have no salvation. We have no eternal life. And if we put it in a, in a different perspective, we would have to deny all the historical data that's, that's made available that says that it really happened. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we have all kinds of groups that theorize multiple plans by uh, what happened to the body, what happened to the, in the tomb, all these things. But it's significant for us to, to note that the, the Lord's post-resurrection appearances were to believers. So, uh, there are people who will not believe no matter what is said to them, no matter what you say and what you do, they will not believe. But if we look at the scripture, we find that his post-resurrection appearances were always to believers with the exception of one that I can tell. And that was Paul. Because when he appeared to Paul, it was it was his, it was Paul. Pre-Paul being saved. It was the Saul. And so Paul was the only one that he really appeared to in, in that way. All the rest were believers. His, his normal method of reaching the lost is, is, is if you think about it, is not through, it's through some spectacular miracles that are performed. His way of reaching the lost is through you and me. So it wasn't, it wasn't to put on a show. It wasn't, he didn't appear to those post-resurrection to put on any kind of show. It was a, uh, he appeared to confirm to people that he was a, truly alive. So that you and I, as children of God, can go out and witness of a living Christ. You see, there are f religions all over the world. And every one of those religions has somebody or something or some person that they put at the head of that religion, that they worship. But every one of those religions worship a false god. They, they, worship, they worship gods that are dead. They worship men that have, have died. But not you and me as children of God. We worship the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive. He's alive. We sing the song, He's alive. He's alive. Praise God He's alive today. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 describes what we are supposed to do as children of God serving a, a Savior who is alive. This, look at what it says. It says, Go. The Great Commission, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, go. Go and tell the world, a world that's lost and dying and going to hell and they need to hear the gospel. And he tells you and me as believers to go. And he doesn't just say, make a destination. That, that, that term there, go, doesn't mean just think of some place uh, else that we need to go to when we get there, start with. It's, it's so important that we know that as we're going, as we're going, 
from the time we take that first step out as we are going. In other words, always, at all times, in all situations, we are to share the gospel. As a child of God, we are to share the good news. Acts 1.8 but if you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. We have a mandate. Very seldom do we, as we live our life, have a clear mandate as to what we're supposed to do. Think about that for just a minute. Think about your life and, and, and how, how many variables you have in your life. How many things that take place that affect what you do, where you go, the situations you find yourself in. Almost nowhere do we have as clear a mandate on a child of God as we do here in Matthew and in Acts is that we're supposed to go and tell the truth, tell the good news. The truth of the matter is that we are supposed to go. We're supposed to, 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 to tell people about Jesus. But there's another truth here too. And that is that sometimes no matter what we do, that we can't convince unbelievers about Jesus. John, the 12th chapter, verse 37 but though he had performed so many signs in their sight, they still were not believing in him. They still didn't believe. No matter what they... That doesn't mean we're supposed to stop trying. It just means that sometimes the harder we try, people still won't believe. Well, even a resurrection appearance would not convince some of the hardened hearts that some of the unbelievers, even that post-resurrection appearances, since those, uh, it says in Luke 16, 31, that do not listen to Moses and the prophets and will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. So we realize that no matter what we do, some people just are not going to believe. But there's three encounters we want to talk about tonight. Three encounters, post-resurrection encounters that we want to discuss tonight. The first one we're going to look at that John, John makes very specific here in the 20th chapter. Uh, we, we want to look at the fact of his post-resurrection appearance to Mary Magdalene. A uh, very important appearance there. Then we're going to look at his appearance to the ten apostles. And I say ten and not twelve because we're going to see that there were only ten there because Judas had already killed himself. So now we're down to eleven and Thomas was not there. So we see his appearance to Mary Magdalene. Then we see his appearance to the ten disciples. Then we see a second appearance to the disciples. But this time, it was very specific. It was to the eleven this time. And the specific appearance was for Thomas. So we're going to look at that tonight. So we're going to have some fun looking through the scripture tonight as we look at how this post-resurrection appearance, first of all, to Mary Magdalene. So let's look at the scripture, John, the 20th chapter, beginning in verse 11. A lot of scripture tonight, so bear with me. I'll get, uh, I'll get, uh, 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 trying to get to, to read all of this, and, and I'll probably have to stop and get a drink of water before I get through with this. But, but stay with me in the scripture. Very important scripture dealing with the resurrection of Jesus. John, the 20th chapter, beginning in verse 11 through 18. It said, But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. So as she wept, she stopped to look inside the tomb. Now remember, she was looking in a cave. And so as, as she stopped, she, was, she had come back to the, to the, to the tomb. And there she was by herself, and she was looking and kind of bent down and looking into the tomb, okay? So you kind of get the picture. She's standing in front of, of the tomb, standing in front of this cave. The stone, the 
covering had been rolled away. She bent down and kind of looking. And here's what she saw. And she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. Now, can you just imagine Mary was already so emotional because it says she was standing there weeping. She had, she had lost this one in her mind. She had lost Jesus, that he had, he had been crucified, and now he was dead. And she was coming back to the tomb to, to see the body. And, and it says when she looked in, she saw two angels. Not the sight that she was expecting to see. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now, that's not a question you want to hear if you're emotional already and you're standing there weeping. And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they put him. I'm desperate. I've looked into the tomb. The body's not here. He's not here. Where is he at? What's happened to him? What's happened? And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and yet she did not know that it was him. Why should she know that it was him? She wasn't expecting Jesus to be alive. She didn't know he was going to be standing there beside her. And so she turned and she didn't see Jesus. But as soon as he did this, she knew. as soon as she heard his voice, you know, it's kind of like the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. You and I as children of God, we should know the voice of God when he speaks to us. We should know Jesus' voice when he speaks to us. It should be very evident to us if we stay prayed up, if we stay read up in the Word of God, if we stay in right and close relationship to God. When He speaks, we know. And when He speaks and we know, we listen. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus saying that, and yet she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you? She repeated, he repeated what the angel just said. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And as soon as she said that, she knew. She, thinking that he was a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. As soon as he said Mary, as soon as he called her name, as soon as he called her by name, she knew. Who is this talking to me? Who is this calling my name? Have you ever heard Jesus call your name? Have you ever heard in, in that deep prayer time, in that deep Bible study time, not audibly, this was audibly, but, not, but to your spirit, he calls you by name. Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you put him and take Jesus said, or Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, can you just imagine? Here Mary, who thought Jesus was gone, and Jesus speaks to her, and she knew who he was. He called her by name. She knew who he was, Rabboni, the teacher. And, and he tells her, Stop clinging to me. I imagine she grabbed a hold of him. She says, I lost you once. I'm not letting go again. I'm not letting go again. And you know what? I, I get this picture, and you're going to have to give me some, some ministerial leeway here. You're going to have to give me some pastoral leeway here. But you see, that's the way I feel too sometimes. Sometimes when I get a little bit of separation from God, when I haven't prayed enough and I haven't studied enough, I haven't stayed as close to Him as I need to, and he just reveals himself to me in such a real way. I want to grab a hold and I don't want to let go. I want it to be like this all the time. And it should be and it can be. But we're the ones that move. God never moves. We're the ones that move. He says to Mary, stop clinging to me for I've not yet ascended. I've got to send back to the Father. He says, you kind of got to let me go. You got to let me go. He says, he says, but, but go. He says, but I got a job for you to do. He says, okay, let go of me 
And here's what I want you to do. He says, I hadn't finished my work. My work's not finished because I have not ascended back to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Very specific in that. He says, it's my Father, but it's also your Father. It's my God, also your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples, I have seen, can you, can you just picture this? Can you picture what Mary Magdalene, how she, the enthusiasm that she must have, she must have ran back to the disciples and she must have been out of breath and she must have been trying, and she probably shouted out, blurted out, trying to grasp for breath and she says, she, and she it says she announced to the, to the disciples. She didn't tell them, she announced it. It's kind of like the town crier. She, she, she was making an announcement. She was telling the world, she says, I've seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Well, let's look at Mary Magdalene for a second. This Mary, this woman from the village of Magdala. Now that's, that's kind of in the, the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, kind of near Tiberias. I've been there. Uh, I've been blessed to be there. Beautiful, beautiful area. But kind of in a nondescript, when you look at Mary Magdalene, I think what we're trying to, what God is trying to demonstrate to us here in His revealing Himself to Mary Magdalene was He reveals Himself to all of us. I think she symbolized the common person. I think she symbolizes the everyday Joe. She symbolizes the fact that God, it, we don't have to be a king or queen. We don't have to be a prince. We don't have to be a leader of nations. We don't have to be someone that other people view as important. That God looks at us, just me. See, God has no, no respecter of person. There's, there's, there's equality at the foot of the cross. We all come to the foot of the cross the same way. We all come as sinners. And we all leave the foot of the cross if we accept Jesus Christ. We all leave the foot of the cross simply as sinners saved by grace. We're all the same. God is no respecter of people. And, and I think Mary kind of symbolizes that. She wasn't a prominent figure. This is... The, the, the fact when we, when we think about her, uh, not very much is said about Mary Magdalene. Uh, there's in Luke, in the eighth chapter, the second verse, it says, And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sickness, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Can you imagine? This is, we don't know a lot about Mary, but we know one thing that what God did for her, much like what God does for us, what God did for her made her eternally grateful and in love with the Lord. You see, there's a, there's a picture here for us about being grateful and being in love with our Savior, and I think that's important. Uh, so as we think about that, nothing really that stands out of the importance for Mary, but yet the Lord chose to appear first to her, a woman. And, and I, 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 I think about this as this, this, the fact that uh, he revealed himself first to this woman. He, he, he declared, if you, if you think back in John the fourth chapter, he declared his messiahship to another woman, a woman at the well. Look at what it says in John 28, 29. I think this is, it is, this is a, a storyline for us tonight. It says, So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is he? Look at what, look at what happens here. What's the, what's the two things we see in common here? The woman at the well and Mary Magdalene, they both went to tell other people the story. I think it's important. We have a story to tell. They had a story to tell. We have a story to tell. 
Peter, Peter and John had left and Mary had returned standing outside the tomb by herself. Mary, Mary stood there weeping uncontrollably. Her love for the Lord was greater than her faith than in anything else. And, and she loved she loved him, but she didn't, she didn't have faith in the promise that he was going to rise again. And, and many times that's, that's who we are. We don't have faith that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. God has never not fulfilled a promise. I think Mary loved the Lord, but I don't think she had the faith to believe in his promise that she was going to rise again. So despite her weak faith and, and, and her maybe doubts, Jesus uh, would not leave her that way. Jesus would not leave her weeping at the tomb. Jesus would not leave her in sorrow. You know, that's the thing about Jesus. Jesus never leaves anybody the same way he finds them. Think about it. Gee, you will never, no one will ever have an encounter with Jesus and leave the same way he was when he encountered Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful picture? While weeping, she looked into the tomb. She saw two angels, and one at the head, one at the feet, where the body of Christ. Then, and then came the question, Woman, why are you weeping? And much like Mary, in some of our darkest moments, all we have to do is turn around, and there's Jesus. I love the story. We're always told about the footprints in the sand, about how Jesus carries us through the storm, carries us through the struggles, carries us through... Isn't that a beautiful picture? All Mary had to do was turn around, and there was Jesus. With a single word, Jesus opened Mary's eyes. He merely spoke her name, Mary. Well, it could have been, think about it, it could have been me. It could have been Larry or Jim or Sally or Bill. It could have been whatever name that somebody needs their name called out by Jesus when they're times of sorrow. And in a flash, all the confusion, all the sorrow, all the doubt, it vanished. Then Mary set out on her way to tell the others. The good news, the, the message, the gospel message, and here's what she was telling them. Jesus is alive. There's not but one thing you can say to that message. There's not but one thing you can add to the message, Jesus is alive. And that's a big hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jesus is alive. So we see he appeared in his post-resurrection appearances. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. All right, let's look at Christ's appearance to the ten disciples. Look at John, the 20th chapter, beginning in verse 19. It says, Now when he was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were to, together due to the fear of the Jews, in other words, the disciples were afraid. The disciples thought, well, they crucified Jesus. They've given us a hard time all along. They're going to come looking for us. So they sequestered, it said, in the room and closed and locked the door behind them. And it says, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Now, the door was closed. So remember that. It said, when they looked, Jesus had come and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. He says, this is who I am. It's me. It's Jesus. Look at my nail print hands. Look at, look at my spear pierced side. Know that it's me. He said, so Jesus said to them, Peace be to you, just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now remember, he had a job for them to do. He had a job for the disciples. He has a job for me and you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive what? The Holy Spirit. You see, we are empowered. The disciples were empowered. We are empowered today by the Holy Spirit of God that indwells within us. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been given, forgiven them. What he's saying, he says, I'm, I'm giving you the power. I'm giving you the strength. I'm giving you what God has given me. That's what Jesus is saying. What God has given me in power, I now give to you. So go out, he says, he says, 
If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Go out, preach the good news, forgiveness of sin, grace. By faith are you saved through grace. It's, it's, it's not of works. It's, it's, it's of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, so we see this scene as shifts to the evening. Mary Magdalene, this appearance has already happened. Now it shifts to that evening. In the res- this is Resurrection Sunday. The disciples were hiding. Like I've already said, they were hiding for fear. Expecting any minute for the temple police would just arrive and end all of this movement of God. In other words, they thought, here we are. We're the ones that are, that are going to need to, to go out and talk about Jesus. But they're going to come. They're going to arrest us. They're going to throw us in prison. They're going to torture us. They're going to... Put it, they're going to kill us like they did Jesus. And it's going to end the whole Jesus movement. Now, one thing I want to say, nothing will end the Jesus movement. God is high and lifted up and on the throne, and not anything, anybody, is going to stop the Lord from having His will and His way. Not only in our lives, but in, in our nation, in our world, in this time that we live in today when there's so many things going on and we get so discouraged, I want us to remember to look to the author and the finisher of our faith. That's Jesus Christ. That's, that's where we need to look. So they were expected to be arrested. They, they were expecting whatever to happen. And in suddenly appears Jesus. He walks in. Ten of the original disciples were there. Like I said, Judas had already killed himself. He had already, he had already done that. Uh, let's, if, we, if we think, let's look at Matthew 27, 5. And it says, And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and left. And he went away and hung himself. Judas, overcome with the, the, the tragedy of what he had done, went out and killed himself. So he wasn't there. Thomas was the only other member of the original twelve not present. Now the scripture says that he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. He was about to ascend to the Father and would leave the great comforter. That's what he said he would do. He says, When I send back to the Father... When I take my rightful place at the right hand to the Father, I will send the great comfort. I will send the Holy Spirit. Jesus delegated authority. If we see this, he says, I delegate the authority to the disciples. He says, if you'll forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. Matthew 16, 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. Those things that we bind up in, in on earth, that's the people we lead to the foot of the cross. Uh, we have the keys to the kingdom as believers. Uh, you know, we, we have the ability to lead people to Jesus for forgiveness of sin. And so when we look at the, the church's authority from the Scripture, uh, because Christ is the head of the church, the church has authority. Look at what it says in Ephesians 1.22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. The supreme authority God has given to the church. And who's the church? You and me. It's not a building. It's us. It's believers in Christ. So here we see he appears to the disciples to indwell them with the Holy Spirit, to give them all power and authority so that they can go out and to preach the good news. All right, the beginning of the gospel message going out to all four corners of the earth. But there's somebody that's missing. Now, he appeared post, 
post-resurrection to Mary Magdalene. Now he's appeared to the disciples, but there's somebody missing in this, in this picture. Who is it? It's Thomas. Thomas. So let's look lastly at Christ's appearance to Thomas. John, the 20th chapter, beginning in verse 24 through 31. Now, let's remember Thomas. It said, But Thomas, one of the twelve, one of the original twelve, who was called Didymus, and that, that word Didymus means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, now his twin, we don't know anything about, really, about Thomas's twin, but we know he was a twin. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. I, I tell you, this is, I, sometimes I think, uh, I, I might almost feel like Thomas sometimes. I wish I'd have been there. Have you ever done that? I mean, if you, somebody calls you on the phone, you should have been at church today. Oh, my goodness, you missed it. You should have been there. You, sh you, should, have been, you should have been at that prayer meeting. You should have been in our Bible study. Oh, you missed it. Have you ever done that? Has any, you ever had that happen to you? I've had that happen to me so many times. And somebody will call me up or I'll see somebody and I'll say, Oh, you, sh you missed it, man. You should have been there. You missed it. And, that, and that, that's what the disciples were doing to Thomas. They said, You missed it, man. You should have been there. So the other disciples said to him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Remember, there's something about old Thomas. We have a name for him. It's, it's, you remember what it is? Doubting Thomas. Remember, we use that to describe people that just you have a hard time convincing of things. Oh, you're an old doubting Thomas. You're a pessimist. You know, you, know, you just doubt everything. And, and that's the kind of, that's really the kind of guy Thomas was. He said, we've seen, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not. Man, you got to show me. I'm like, I'm like the guy from Missouri, the show me state. You got to show me. I'm not just going to take it at your word. You, you have to show me. Eight days later, his disciples, again, same place. And Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came the, the door had came to the door and the door having been shut and stood in their midst and said, Peace be to you. Same thing he said last time, eight days earlier. And he said to Thomas. Now see, he, he was there for a purpose. The purpose was Thomas. He knew what he was there for. He knew what he needed. He knew what Thomas said eight days earlier. So, I mean, you, you think you can... You can say something that God doesn't hear. You think you can do something that God doesn't know about. You think you can have an attitude that God's not aware of. It doesn't happen. Thomas, God knew exactly what Thomas had said. God knew exactly what Thomas uh, had said about showing me and that pessimism in, it, in his heart. And he said, place your finger here. You wanted to see my hands? Here you go. Place your finger here and see my hands. Take your hands and put into my side and do not continue in disbelief, but be a believer. Don't continue in your doubting ways. Don't continue in your pessimism. Don't continue in your, your thinking negatively. He says, put your hands in my hands. Put, fill that, that hole in my side. And Thomas answered and said to him, Lord, and my, my Lord and my God. That's, that's the only way. When you come to the reality of who Jesus is, the only answer you can give is my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me and you now believe, blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. So then many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in Him. Praise the Lord. Oh, doubting Thomas, the eternal, the eternal pessimist, he seemed always to, to find the, the dark cloud in every silver lining. You ever, you ever meet people that way? I, I know people like that. 
It don't matter what happens. They're going to find the, the dark side of everything. They're going to find, I mean, the, it doesn't matter what happens. They're all, they always look at the bad side. They always look at the dark side. Man, the disciples said, it was too bad you weren't here. Man, you should have been here. I, where were you at? I don't know where you were at. I don't know what you're doing. I, were you out moping? Were you out feeling sorry for yourself? Were you, were you out being negative and pessimistic? Were you out being melancholy? Just drooping around and moping around? Did you not want to be with the rest of us? And Thomas was like so many skeptics. He had to be convinced. And the Lord met Thomas at the point of his weakness and his doubt. And he did that without rebuke. Look at that for just a minute. This loving, caring, merciful God that we serve. He comes to us in our weakest moments. He comes to us in our weakest times. He comes to us when we have doubts and fears. And he doesn't come and rebuke us. He comes and shows us love. That's exactly what he did to Thomas. He says, my Lord, my God. Thomas' confession and Christ's response are fitting leads into John's summary in the last part of John's gospel. He says, but these things I have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Folks, that's the most important thing you'll ever have to believe. What is it that Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I hope you believe that tonight. My prayer is tonight, if you don't believe that, if you have doubts about that, that you find someone. You find someone that knows the Lord. You find someone that, that you feel like has a relationship with Christ, you talk to them. You call the church, talk to one of our pastors. Because the, the greatest decision you'll ever make is turning your heart and life over to Jesus Christ. Don't be like Thomas. Don't, don't be a doubter. Don't be a pessimist. Don't live in this world. This world is a tough place. I couldn't live in this world without Jesus. And you don't have to. Praise the Lord for God's mercy and grace. Amen. I hope you pull something out of God's Word tonight that will bless your heart, touch your life. May God put someone in your path this week that, that you can share Jesus with. And if you don't know Him as your personal Savior, may God put someone in your path that will share Jesus with you. God bless you. Have a great week.